Hey guys, hope you enjoyed your Easter. I know I did. Uh, we are so excited to be together again and to wrap up our series on Easter and the resurrection. Uh, we get to hear Lindsay speak on that in a few moments. Um, but I just want to let you know that we are a community of people that love Jesus and want to shape our lives to be more like him. But wherever you are on that journey, whether you believe in Jesus or not, um, we're just so excited that you joined us today. And uh, we want you to know that you're welcome and hope you feel welcome. So without further delay, here's Lindsay. Hey, WNT fam, I'm coming at you from my house again for, I think maybe the fourth week or fifth week of quarantine. I can't even keep track of the days anymore. Everything is crazy. Thankfully, I've remembered it's Wednesday and so it's time to hang out with you guys. Um, and I'm, I'm so excited to be together with you guys tonight and to talk about Easter again for our final night of this incredible series before we jump into our next series about what it's like to share our faith with others and how we can do that. And um, I'm really excited to dig into that the next few weeks. But uh, before we jump into tonight, I just wanted to um, remind you of where we've been the last couple of weeks. And so the first week Taylor taught and he taught us um, about the implication of Easter, that fear isn't final, that because of Jesus work on the cross, that we have nothing to fear. Um, we know how the story ends. We have a God who is in charge of the world, um, who reigns, who is um, over all. And so we don't have to fear anything. And that's um, a beautiful implication of the Easter story. And then last week, uh, I got to teach and kind of walk us through um, why was it that Jesus needed to die and why is the death and resurrection of Jesus so important? And we talked about how, how Jesus' death and resurrection actually conquers um, fear and it conquers death and it conquers sin once and for all. And it's just this beautiful thing that means new life is actually possible for us because death is no longer in the picture. Sin does not have a hold on us. So new life is possible in Jesus. And, and tonight we're going to dig into... Um, some awesome passages of scripture. We're going to be in John 14 and 16 and a little bit in uh, the book of Acts. And these are just incredible passages with huge implications for us that come back to the Easter story. And and there's um, just going to be some more good news, I think, for you guys to dwell on in this season of hard and difficult news. And um, I hope you guys had an incredible time celebrating Easter. And I think um, something that I hope for us in this season is that Easter isn't just one day, but we can continue in this season to celebrate what has God done? What is he doing in the world? And how can I jump into that? And that's what our next series is going to be about. Um, how can I become the person um, that Jesus called me to be in, in sharing um, his message of hope? Um, with the world around me. And so uh, tonight we're going to we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of those implications um, and, and celebrate just a little bit more, um, hopefully, the work that Jesus did at Easter. And, and I don't know about all of you guys, but um, even in this season of celebrating Easter and there's maybe a few things more going on than the last several weeks of quarantine, but I still have just had some lonely times, some stressful times, some difficult times during um, the coronavirus quarantine and the stay-at-home order that we're all going through. And and maybe that's that's you guys too. Maybe um, maybe you've been alone in your house, going a little bit crazy. I think for some of us, that's led to some hilarity. Maybe you've made some amazing TikToks or had a hilarious dance party all by yourself while everybody that you live with was gone, or maybe you got so desperate that you FaceTimed someone for a record amount of time, um, or maybe you started talking to your plants, um, or at least naming them like I have. Uh, and the truth is that like we're just all adjusting right now, and we're coping in so many different weird ways, and I think um, our isolation and our loneliness might look a lot of different ways, and um, we're each adjusting to this situation uniquely. I know for me, I told you guys, I've, I've been naming my plants. We named um, our new fern Covey. Um, but, but maybe for you, you're, you're adjusting to um, being with a lot of people. I know that's me right now at home. Everybody in my house is home. We have housemates. Nate and I live with um, our friends Tim and Michelle and then our friend Katie. And 
So there's been a lot of people around and that's been really fun, um, but it's also adjustment. It's something to get used to. It's really different than what um, our normal lives look like. And, and I've been adjusting to just my job being really different. And I know you guys have been adjusting to school being really different and maybe you're around your siblings a lot more or maybe your parents are just working like crazy and you've just been absolutely alone in the house. And I, I don't know what it looks like for you, but I know that even if we're surrounded by people, this season can feel really lonely. And, and even though we know other people are also struggling and other people are also adjusting to um, what this season looks like, it's, it's easy for us to feel isolated and alone. And, and I know that quarantine isn't the only time that you guys have felt alone in life. It's not the only time that I've felt alone in life. I know I've had seasons of loneliness. I think for me, one is my freshman year of college. I had to um, commute from home, which um, took an hour and a half each way. And so I just never really made friends my freshman year of college. And so I think back to that time as a significant period of, of loneliness and also one that God taught me a ton. Um, and and I think of just times when I've had to make decisions on my own where I felt lonely or times when I was going through doubt or fear that I felt like other people couldn't understand or maybe I felt alone in um, standing by certain beliefs. Um, but I know that I've had seasons of feeling lonely um, and that this is one of them um, during quarantine. Uh, and I know that that's maybe true for you guys too, but at this point in your life, I'm sure that you've had seasons of, of feeling alone. Maybe it's because your family moved or because your friend group changed or you went through a breakup or your parents' marriage was falling apart and you didn't know how to talk about it with people around you or maybe a bunch of your friends started hanging out without you um, or excluding you or maybe you made some decisions in your life that other people didn't understand and you just felt isolated or maybe you had doubts or other feelings that you felt like nobody understood. Maybe you were just going through something really hard that you didn't feel like you had a safe person to talk to about um, that. And, and so there's, there's a lot of things um, that might trigger this feeling of loneliness in us. And, and I think we all know what it's like to feel alone or to feel like we're on our own. And, and sometimes um, we think of being on our own as this beautiful, liberating thing. But um, when we're talking about loneliness, um, that's not a positive thing. That, that comes with some fear, some uncertainty, anxiety, and, and that can all get wrapped up into our loneliness. And, and when we're on our own, I think um, we tend to feel more overwhelmed by our feelings, by what we're going through. And, and we start believing things that might seem true in the moment, but, but generally aren't. We might really start to believe that, that nobody understands what we're going through or that we'll never get through what we're facing. Um, we can feel overwhelmed by our situations and our circumstances and our feelings and our pain and our confusion. And um, statistically speaking, uh, about half of Americans actually feel alone. And that, that stat is from before the coronavirus. And um, I know that maybe for some of you, being alone can be really nice. I, I'm an introvert, and so I can spend long periods of time by myself and actually enjoy it. But, but there's a difference between being alone and feeling feeling alone is right isn't there there there's this difference between alone and lonely and and when it comes to loneliness our generation is full of loneliness coronavirus aside and, and that sense of loneliness has contributed to a rise in things like anxiety and self-harm and depression and even suicide in our culture um, because loneliness makes us feel hopeless it makes us feel overwhelmed in our circumstances and and i believe that God actually wired us to respond to loneliness that way, not because he wanted us to feel depressed or sad, but, but because he actually wired us for close relationships. We were never meant to carry the weight of what we feel or experience or worry about on our own as people. And, and so it makes sense that when we don't have people to walk through life with, that when we feel alone, um, things don't feel right in our world. And so what do we do about that? Sometimes uh, people are gonna give us all sorts of answers, right? Show up for your friends, invest in your friendships, join a small group. Um, those things are all great, but I think even so, even if you have relationships around you that are really good, there's just times when 
being alone and feeling alone are just unavoidable parts of life. And so we have to learn what does it look like to handle that and what does God have to say about that? And so tonight we're going to talk about what happened the very first Easter and the implications of that in the days following and how that can be just a total game changer for us when it comes to journeying through our own seasons of loneliness. And and so we're, we're going to talk about the very first Easter, right? The very first Easter, Jesus left his closest friends feeling overwhelmed um, and alone, maybe in a similar way to what you're experiencing right now. And when you think about it, Jesus has just died. And, and for years, they have been traveling together, doing life together, hanging out every day with Jesus, and, and suddenly they're on their own. At least that's what they thought, right, for a few days between Jesus' death and resurrection. And we don't spend a ton of time at Easter thinking about the time between Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, but I can guarantee you that his followers, Jesus' followers, his disciples, don't didn't forget what that difficult time actually felt like. And Jesus' closest friends and, and followers had walked away from everything in their life, from jobs, from family members, from finances and safety and security to follow him. And, and then he died. And, and so the future that they had been imagining for their leader and their country and themselves just totally vanished. Um, everything changed. And so um, they reacted in a variety of ways to that overwhelmed, lonely feeling of Jesus leaving, of Jesus dying. And some of them stuck together, but many of them ran for their lives or hid from people um, who they were afraid of, who had killed Jesus. Um, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, were likely lonely and afraid in those days. And and we, uh, on this the other side of history, right, know how the story ends. But at the time, they didn't fully comprehend what was about to happen. And so we can imagine their surprise and relief at seeing Jesus alive again. And, and that's the good news of the Easter story, right, that we talked about last week, that Jesus was literally, actually physically dead. And then three days later, he was literally, actually physically alive. That's what we celebrate at Easter. Um, and that was true. But then Jesus actually left again. Uh, Jesus died, came back to life, and then left again. He ascended to heaven to be with his father. Um, but this time when Jesus left, the disciples' response was completely different. And um, we know about the disciples' response to Jesus leaving the second time because there um, is a document written down by a doctor named Luke who investigated this entire story of Jesus' life. Maybe you've heard of the Gospel of Luke or the Book of Luke, um, which is all about Jesus' life and then death and resurrection. Um, but that's not the only thing that Luke wrote. There's actually a second book to, to um, that Gospel, and it's called the Book of Acts. It records what happens after um, Jesus leaves them again. And according to Luke, when Jesus left a second time and, and ascended to heaven to be with God the Father, Jesus' followers didn't seem to think that they'd been left alone again. They didn't respond like they were alone. And in fact, it wasn't until after Jesus left this second time that Christianity actually took off and began to change human history forever. And, and it seems like Jesus actually planned it that way, which is pretty cool. Um, We'll get to the rest of what Luke said here in a little bit um, as we dive into the book of Acts. But before we do, I want to look at another document, which is written by one of Jesus' closest friends um, and disciples. Uh, his name is John, and he wrote the Gospel of John, which we're going through right now uh, in w &T, which is awesome. Uh, but the Gospel of John gives us this awesome look into the interactions between Jesus and his disciples uh, right before he was crucified. It kind of records Jesus' last words and and so we get to hear those words that Jesus spoke to his disciples. Um, and they were some sweet words of hope. And there's some sweet words of hope to us as well as we navigate life um, on this side of Jesus' death and resurrection. So we're going to read John 14 verses 15 to 27. And um, I'll just go ahead and jump in and read that for us really quick. Um, feel free to grab your phone and follow, follow along. Um, again, it's John 14, and then we're going to be in verses 15 to 27, and I'll just go ahead and read for you guys. Um, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is Jesus speaking. Um, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. 
You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. And that day you will know that I am, my, I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your hearts not be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So these are these comforting words from Jesus. Jesus is telling us about the helper, his spirit, who will come to be with us once Jesus has gone. And these are some of the nuggets of truth that I see when I open up this passage of scripture and just kind of look back through it. I see that that it says that Jesus is going to give us another helper, that he's going to ask the Father, and the Father is going to send another helper that will be with us forever. Um, Jesus says that he will not leave us as orphans. He won't leave us alone. He will come to us. Um, he says that we will live because he lives. Just as he is raised from the dead, so also we will receive new life like we talked about last week. And then he says things like that. He will make his home with us. His spirit will make his home with us, that uh, his spirit will teach us all things, that his spirit, the helper, will bring to our remembrance all that Jesus taught. Um, and then he says that he leaves his peace with us and that we don't need to be troubled or afraid. And so these are encouraging words to the disciples. And then um, if you look two chapters later, Jesus is continuing to remind his disciples um, about this. And he, and he says um, in chapter 16, verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And so Jesus is saying, I have to go. Um, he promised that if he left, it would actually be better for us um, because the Holy Spirit would be there. And once the Holy Spirit arrived, the power and spirit of Jesus that once resided in a human body of Jesus, right, could now re reside everywhere. He's talking about the Spirit coming and making his home in those who follow Jesus. And, and so fast forwarding a few days, right, Jesus has been crucified, died, buried, raised to life again. He's appeared to many people, and then he is about to leave again. And right before Jesus ascends into heaven and leaves for the second time, he reminds his disciples of what he said um, in their last time together, he refers back to John chapter 14 and 15. And, and he reminds them that, yes, his physical body was leaving. But God's spirit, the helper, would be coming soon. Just like what we read about in the book of John, right? Um, it, so he reminds his followers. And, and this is now in Acts chapter 1, if you want to turn there. Um, we'll just read verse 8. Uh, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And of all the things that Jesus could have reminded his disciples about, he chose to remind them that the Holy Spirit was on the way, that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came. Uh, he would give them power to do what Jesus called them to do, to tell people all over the world about him. And in other words, it was this reminder that even though he was leaving them, that they were not going to be alone. And that's exactly what happened. In the days and weeks to come, right, Jesus' followers would receive the power of the Holy Spirit to tell people all over the world about him. And, and today, roughly one-third you guys, of the earth's population says they believe that message about Jesus. 
that Jesus, who is the Son of God, came to earth as a man, reconciled our relationship with God through his death and resurrection, and conquered sin and death for those who trust in him. And, and so this Christian movement that was started by Jesus and carried on by his first disciples outlasted all sorts of things like the powerful Roman Empire, the intense persecution from governments and, and other religious groups, and thousands of years of change, so much change. The men and women who Jesus left twice, once when he died and once when he returned to his father in the ascension, started the greatest movement in human history. Even when their leader seemingly left, even with their overwhelming lack of resources, even with their perceived powerlessness in the face of the powers, the authorities of the day. It, it was the Holy Spirit who came and gave them power, even though they seemed powerless. And even though Jesus left, he sent the Holy Spirit to be with them. And, and that meant that even though Jesus wasn't physically there, they knew that they would never be alone. And, and the best part about all this is that Jesus promise wasn't just for his first disciples. This isn't just something that we get to look back on in history. When Jesus promised the helper who would give us power and be with us, that was not just true for his disciples. That was true for everyone who would ever believe in him. And, and that means that you and I have access to that very same spirit if we have trusted in the work of Jesus in his death and resurrection and have allowed him to be in charge of our lives. If, if we're followers of Jesus, his spirit lives in us. So, so Easter, the story of Easter is so much bigger than a celebration of something that happened 2,000 years ago. Yes, Jesus' resurrection changed everything, and the historical event of the resurrection is the center of everything that we believe as Christians. But like we've been talking about, the resurrection matters for you and me at today and right now. And, and one of the reasons it matters is because it's this reminder that God's power and presence are still available to us today. And so Easter can change everything about how we live our lives right now, because Easter means that we are never alone. Easter means that God's spirit lives in us. Jesus left so that the helper could come um, and so that we could live the life that Jesus called us to live so that we could follow him. And so Jesus' first followers knew, you guys, what it was like to feel alone. After he died, it seemed like all their hopes were crushed. They may have even felt like they made a huge mistake by following Jesus. And, and while I can imagine they loved seeing Jesus come back to life and were so excited at his resurrection, they were probably surprised when Jesus didn't stay with them. They were probably wondering how Jesus not physically being with them could actually be a good thing. But soon they learned that it was because something was coming. Someone actually was coming, right? A helper, God's own spirit to dwell in each of them, to empower them, to be with them. And it reminded them that they would never be alone, that Jesus would be with them always to the end of the age, like he says um, at, at, the, um, at the ascension. And, and so what if you and I could live with the same assurance and confidence that the disciples did after receiving the Holy Spirit? What if no matter how lonely or overwhelmed or misunderstood we felt, we could trust that we are never alone? Let me ask it this way. What if this is actually real? Like, what if the literal, actual God who created everything and died and rose again is literally always with you? Not figuratively, not a metaphor. What if the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, is very real and is right here and right now and wants to help you with what you're facing today? So simply trusting that the Holy Spirit is with us can, can change everything for us. If, if we believe that this is real, even though we can't see Jesus, even though we can't sense his Spirit always, or we may not always feel like his spirit is there. Having the knowledge and trusting that the spirit of God is with us in the moments that we feel like we're on our own means that we can be confident of a couple of things and has, I think, two really important implications for us. The first one is that we can talk to Jesus. We can talk to his spirit anytime, any place, for any reason. And the, and the, second, the second implication is that we can know that we're stronger than we think we are. So let's go back to the first one, that we can talk to Jesus. 
You can talk to him at any time, any place, for any reason. I think that if we would choose to talk to God when we feel alone about what we're going through, it would change everything. In, in the New Testament, we learn that the Holy Spirit helps us talk to God even when we don't know what to say. So um, maybe what if the next time you felt like you were alone, you're feeling lonely, you're feeling overwhelmed? What if you chose to talk to God about what you're facing or feeling? What would happen if you chose to believe that God hears you, that his spirit dwells in you and is at work in you in ways that you may not know or see. Uh, I think that would change everything. I think that if we turn to him and talk to him at any place, at any time, for any reason, that we would build this really cool relationship, this really cool relationship of trust with the spirit. And, and then the second implication, I think, is that we would know we are stronger than we think we are. We would talk to him at any time, any place, for any reason, and we would know that we're stronger than we often think we are. I think when we when we look back, the odds were stacked against Jesus' first followers. Jesus wasn't there. They were underqualified. The Roman Empire was incredibly powerful. Yet the movement that these men and women carried forward has forever changed the world, the course of history. And, and that's because it looked to outsiders like they were on their own. But even though it looked that way, they, they actually had God's power flowing in and through their lives. And the same is true for us. When we face challenges that seem too overwhelming for us, we can be confident that God's spirit is in us, that his power in us cannot be overcome. And we can be confident that God's power in other believers will be there to support us as well. And, and maybe you feel like what you're facing is too powerful for you. What you're going through is too much. Uh, and that may be true, you guys. I don't think that we were meant to be able to bear those things. But here's the good news is that it is not too powerful for the one that is in you um, and the one that is in other Jesus followers around you. And he will give you what you need to make it through. You were not designed to walk through this alone. Um, I love Romans chapter 8 verse 11. It says that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I love that reminder that the spirit who lives in us is the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. That is a powerful spirit that lives and dwells in us. Um, we are stronger than we think. The spirit of God dwells in us. And, and so I think we can we can move from here with confidence. Easter means that we are never alone. The power of Easter is that Jesus enabled us to be confident of that, that we will never be alone again because we trust in his spirit that lives inside of us, especially during a season where so many of us are lonely. I think this might be the happiest news that we've heard in a while. Easter means that you're never alone. God's spirit dwells in you. And so today, as you um, head back to small groups, I want you to think about this question. In what area of life do you feel alone? What do you feel alone in right now? And then I want you to share that in small group. And then after small group, I want you to take that to Jesus, the same Jesus who loves you and died for you. Imagine that he is looking you in the eyes and saying, you're not on your own here. We're in this together. I love you. Because of my spirit in you, you are stronger than you know. And maybe the best news that you'll hear this week is that you don't just have to imagine Jesus saying that to you because the Holy Spirit makes that a reality. That's why Easter is so very happy. Um, so happy Easter, you guys. We're done with this series. I'm going to pray for you and then we'll head back to our groups on Zoom. Jesus, thanks for this time with my friends. Thanks for your word. Thanks for your words to your disciples. Um, the assurance that you are sending a helper. You are sending your spirit to dwell in us, God. We are not alone in what we walk through, and I pray over this community of, um, of students who are seeking to follow you, Jesus, to become more like you. Um, I pray that you would teach us to turn to you, that we would not go through things alone, and God, that we would know that the power of your spirit in us um, is more powerful than we know. And I pray that we would take comfort in that. And I pray that we would continue into this week and this next season to celebrate the implications of Easter, of your death and resurrection. Uh, we thank you, God, that, that Easter means that fear 
doesn't have to rule over us. We thank you that Easter means that new life is possible. And we thank you that Easter means that we're never alone. God, that you're going to do great things, um, that you're going to glorify yourself through us, God, um, and that we're not alone while we do it. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for this time. Amen. All right, guys, see you back in small groups. Thank you, Lindsay, for giving that message. Uh, just a few announcements for you guys before we jump into small groups. The first of which is uh, we just want to invite you guys to join us in the daily devos we've been doing. Uh, we're, we're working through the book of John together. And uh, you can find that and track along with us on the Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we have that plan for you. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're late. Just jump in and, and we'd love to do that with you. And the second thing is we'd love to invite you guys also to join in our weekly rhythms that we've been practicing. Uh, we've got Devo Mondays where we join together and uh, 3 p.m. on Zoom and talk about the, day, the Devo for that day. Um, we've got Worship Tuesdays. We'll give you guys some song suggestions we'd love for you to listen to. Um, just some worship songs that we're, we're loving. Uh, WT Wednesday, which is what you're doing right now. Uh, we'll have games, teaching, and small groups from 7.15 to 9 on Wednesdays on Zoom. And then Social Thursdays, we're encouraging you guys to reach out to each other, to your friends, to, um, yeah, to have fellowship virtually. And then Reflection Fridays, where we encourage you guys to journal or and reflect however you prefer um, on your week. And we'll get, provide you guys with some questions uh, that we think would be helpful to think through. So yeah, that's all I got for you guys. Uh, enjoy small groups.